So uh, there you go, uh, recording started. Now, I would like to introduce uh, David to you all. David is an IT professional who has worked with the various platforms since uh, 1980s with a variety of development analysis tools. Uh, David is a seasoned speaker presented at Philasog, CSOG, uh, SGF previously, and in many other places. And David sent us a variety of topics. Uh, we had a quick chat internally. We decided Unix X command tips and tricks is what we will use uh, for this session. Although I'm sure we'll cover other exciting topics that David has to present uh, next time. So David, it's a pleasure to have you here. And without further ado, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. And uh, yes, one of, the, uh, one of the presentations I gave was at a conference at Oxford. Uh, on the uh, the Arthur Neville shoot, and one of the things we did while we were there was uh, tour Bletchley Park. I figured that would be an appropriate background. All right, uh, the deck has been shared. Um, I feel free to uh, to share it with the uh, the members. Um, the abstract uh, you've you've seen that. All right, you've heard about my background. So the X command allows you to. I want to want to hide the uh, other people so I can see my whole screen. Uh, the X command allows you to execute operating system commands from inside your SAS program. Now, in particular, I'm going to talk about Unix, Unix Linux, but uh, it it works under other operating systems. It certainly works under uh, the PC, that type of thing. The most important thing is that it be enabled, and the option is literally X command. The only problem is this is an option that you cannot set inside of your program. Uh, if, if anybody's uh, chatting, um, I, I can't see the chats or maybe those are participants beeping in. Um, so you can't set this option at, in your program. It can only be set at startup. And if it's disabled, no X command, uh, and you try to set it, it won't let you. I'm sorry, you're just out of luck. Uh, I'll talk about a couple options towards the end, but uh, it, there's no option when it's turned off. Uh, the, the university edition, when, when it was available, was set no X command. The funny thing is the Python tool, the Jupyter uh, notebook, allowed you to ish, uh, issue uh, operating system commands, which, which was kind of funny uh, because you could fiddle around with options from there. Uh, in, in the SAS program, but we won't talk about that. The basics X command runs independent of the data steps and macros. All right? It just happens. Um, the SAS engine itself will interpret some commands. Within, um, within most operating systems, there is a callable uh, capability, an API, to execute uh, various uh, operating system functions change directories, rename files, delete files. You can often do that by via the API. Um, you can also do that via a command line, the shell command, and that's what X does, except when the engine itself decides to interpret some of those commands. And it doesn't spawn off a subprocess. It's one uh, entity, because when you uh, spawn off a subprocess, particularly Unix Linux, Information does not persist between subprocesses. So if I have two X commands, they're in the same context. They're sharing the same information. Whereas if they were separate subprocesses, they wouldn't share. Right. Um, and, and, and I find handling within the log is a bit annoying. You can get used to it. Um, I just believe in full disclosure. So let's talk about some examples. So in Unix, PWD is print working directory. Tell me where I am. And CD is change directory. Uh, Unix Linux is built on a tree structure, in case you're not familiar. So PWD works fine. All right. Shows you your current directory. Funny thing is that tells you above the command. Um, when you do a CD, it just does it, it doesn't tell you. It doesn't say, did this work or not? It just happens. Yeah, and then it actually did work. If I execute another PWD, it'll tell me that, but 
again, in the log on line 27, it's not telling me whether this command worked or not. Echo is a way to show um, information within the shell. It actually works, and I'll show some examples later, but it doesn't actually do anything. Or, I'm sorry, it does things, but it doesn't um, fully interpret the command line. Because in Unix, dollar home is a variable, and it's actually your uh, home directory where you log into. Okay. But I don't see it in the log. Another example is you can do multiple commands on one line separated by semicolons. Print working directory, change directory, print working directory. There's no output. I have no idea if this worked. Um, again, one of the annoyances of the way it works in the log. Uh, as I mentioned, we can combine commands on one line under Unix. In this case, I have three echo commands. I echo the word start, the word mid, the word end, and I actually send it to a file. And I know this worked because if I actually go and look at that file, I see the value that I put into it. In this case, start and mid did not appear in that file because of the way the statement's written, only the last echo, the one that echoes the word end, saves the output to a file. Now, if I put parentheses around that command before redirecting to my output file, left parentheses, echo start, echo mid, echo end, close parentheses, all three statements will put that into that one file. And I know that works because I can look at that file and I see that result. Right. The difference is the parentheses, which combines the output in Unix. Right. Essentially, because of the way I wrote the statement. Now, I can figure out whether a command worked or not, because I have the variable sysrc. It will return the Unix error code. And in this case, it resolves to zero, and zero is success in Unix. And of course, I can use that. I mean, I can, I can just do a put. I can do conditional logic. It's up to me what I would do with that, but I have the capability of looking at it. Uh, key, zero is success in Unix. Um, if the command doesn't exist, I'll actually get a value of 127. Um, I can also save the output. The number two with the greater than sign says, save my error output, any error messages to a file. In which case I will actually see the Unix message um, bashes the shell. That's the thing that's executing your command what I typed in and command not found. Working commands can also give you errors by returning a non-zero error code. The ls command is list directory. Show me the files, show me some information about them. I'm saying show me all files and the long listing, which will give me size and date and, and permissions but it's a file that doesn't exist. As a result, I get the value two. That's telling me I have an error. And like I said, you can perform conditional logic based on that. Okay. How do I know what those values are? Well, there's a command called man, which is short for manual. And typically towards the bottom of the manual page for a particular command, it will tell you the exit status. So if you get a zero, it worked. A one, there's some minor problems. 
uh, maybe it doesn't have permissions in that area. And two, it doesn't find that name. And these exit statuses are different for each command. So if you care, if you care why it failed other than it worked or it didn't, uh, you need to look these up. In addition to X, we have sysexec. And these execute within the context of the macro. Uh, in this case, I'm, I'm going back, I'm doing a, a listing. I'm gonna save the output to a file, look at my sysrc, execute a command that doesn't exist. So we can see the error, save the output and check sysrc. Okay. And I execute my macro. Now, the odd thing is the greater than sign doesn't show in either of these cases. And it has something to do with the way uh, the line's being interpreted, but it worked. And in the second example, command does not exist. Well, it still doesn't exist. I get the 127. And I know this is a silly little simple example, but again, I can do conditional logic. All right, if, if uh, I'm, I do an, an LS and I have five files, I can uh, spawn off uh, uh, five blocks of code to execute them, um, uh, whatever is appropriate for my, uh, my process. I also have the capability within data steps with something called call system. Now in this case, and I'll, I'll talk about this later, there is the file name pipe command. And what this does, I'm taking a listing of a directory. I'm taking two records because I want a short, easy example. I read in file names. I create a command that will echo, print out the result, save the output to a file, okay. check sysrc, and then I'm going to execute this command does not exist. We'll talk about sysTask a little bit later. Uh, the interesting thing about sysTask is even though this is in a loop, it only runs once. And here you note the output. That's the result. I'm saying print working directory. I'm saying wait for it. I got two records out of that command, out of the pipe command. And I have two records, two observations in my output. And what I have is the name of the files, right? file one, file two, that's the result. The string, the string that got executed was echo that file name, save the output to this file. The first system RC, the one for the echo command, there's zero, we know it works. That wasn't in the log, but I do have a value that I can save. And then the second one, the failed command is 127 as we expected. And if I go and look at the output file, I have the two words, file one, file two. Two, uh, two records are read, two records were written, two records are written to the output text file. With this command, the SAS engine does not interpret these commands, it just passes them. SysTask operates in two modes. With the shell modifier, SAS does not interpret the commands. It takes whatever string you give and it passes it to the shell. It says, shell, I don't know what this is, you figure it out. Without the shell, it behaves like X command. It will interpret the data itself and not allow the shell to do interpretations. 
Okay. So the first one, and the default is no shell, by the way. Um, the first one is no shell. And the string we see is beginning of line, the dollar home word, and end of line. Home is not interpreted. The variable is not interpreted. In the second example, which we are sending to the shell, same string, I get a different output. I have my beginning of line. This is the actual home directory. That's the value stored in dollar home in the shell and end of line. It depends on what you want, whether you want the engine to interpret it or the shell. SysRC is set, which can be useful. There's a few other options. Wait. So I can either fire off a command and continue executing my program. It's up to me whether I want it to or not. Cleanup. Cleanup will wait for this command and any others that are no wait before allowing the, the process to continue. So I fire off a bunch of these. I run some other uh, data steps. I have a last one and I use cleanup and it'll execute that command and wait for all the other ones before it continues. Um, as I mentioned, uh, shell, you can also specify the shell to use. Okay. Unix and Linux support multiple shells. And whichever one you want, you can specify. Specify your preference. You can, uh, obviously they have different, uh, uh, slightly different syntaxes. Uh, you may or may not have one on your particular system. Uh, you can specify something other than a default. Status, right? if you don't want to use sysrc, you can specify a status variable. Uh, this is useful if you have a series of them running um, and, and you want to be able to check the, the uh, statuses independently. You can assign a task name. If you don't assign a task name, it's just going to sequentially assign task and a number. And you can use SysTask to list any statuses that of running processes. In this case, it was complete. If you're running no wait, there's a the wait for command, which will wait for these SysTasks to complete. And I can either use the task number or I can assign each one independently, independent names, as I mentioned. You can wait for any of them. One of these things has to finish. I don't care which one. And that's the default. Or I can wait for everything to finish. I have a series of processes that I've kicked off. I don't want to do the last one. right? I have, I have three independent processes that are running in parallel. And I need to combine all the data when done. Well, then I want to wait for all. I can also specify how long to wait, a maximum time, by specifying the timeout, uh, timeout option. If, if it's not done, uh, don't worry about it, just keep going. As I mentioned, uh, file name pipe. It acts like a normal file name statement, uh, except that it accepts data written from SAS, right, file put, um, provides data SAS to read from a command. Right? It allows me to put a command inside there rather than a, an actual file, physical file. Um, it's more efficient than running the, the command separately. Right? I, could, I gave examples where I sent my list output into a file and then read, I could read that in, or I could pipe it. And inside the quotes, you specify the Unix command that you want, and it will process. Um, you know, it, it's also handy if you have version limitations. The file name zip option, starting with 9.4 uh, M5, allows the use of gzip. So I can specify that I want to use the gzip compression rather than plain zip. 
under Unix Linux. But if I'm running an older version, well, then I can do a file name pipe, gzip minus C that says get my, the gzip command will get its data input from the pipe and send the output to that name. And as I'm writing the data inside my program, my uh, put statement, it's going into the gzip and gzip is compressing it record by record by record, writing an output to the file. One catch though. Oh, sorry, here's the example. All right. File name pipe, I have my in file, I input my results. This could have been any other file. It doesn't behave really any differently. The Unix commands are executed prior to the input statement. Um, unfortunately, sysrc is not set by file name pipe. In this case, I'm executing three commands that don't exist. So the result is I'm actually getting three lines that say the same thing, okay. command not found, but my sysrc is zero. And fortunately, it's a limitation. I don't know whether that works or not. Um, it does come in handy. There, there's, there's another catch. File name pipe is controlled by no X command. If no X command is set, you don't have file name pipe. It's unfortunate. Uh, some, some uh, administrators view the, the, the ability to run X command pipe uh, as a security flaw um, and, they, and they disable it. Uh, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a flaw, um, but, but some of them believe that. Well, with no X command, uh, none of those work. This, the X, X command, sys task, none of those work, unfortunately. So there's a way around it. You can move the commands into a shell script. All right. Rather than ex uh, uh, running those commands directly in your program, you put them in a shell script, you run the shell script. I go to a particular directory with the CD command. I can check return codes. Right. Exit gets me out of the, uh, the shell script. I can save my output to a file. My SAS program, instead of reading from a pipe, would read from a file. It would do its processing. It would gzip that output file directly rather than through the pipe or through an X command. Right? We have alternatives if we don't have the, uh, the X command. It comes in handy though, because you, can, you have a, you know, a little bit more efficiency. You have direct visibility in your program what's happening. What's in this file that I'm reading? Well, it's the output of this command. Right. It, it's all about choices. Right. Sometimes it's better to execute those commands in your program, sometimes not. This, this is a, an old time uh, Unix uh, cartoon, right? Do I learn VI or Emacs? Do I code in basic or assembler? I have so many choices to make, right? Do I want onions on my pizza? I've been questions. looking at the, at the chat. I uh, yep. don't see many questions there at the moment, but I have a, I have a question 
for you to ask uh, when we publish this we got some uh, when we publish this topic some people text it and that's what also been reflecting in the chat that so many platforms disabled x command there's clearly obvious reasons some of them again in chat like some servers are public and you might want to disable it but many people work on many platforms including myself and very rarely x command is on um, what's your thoughts about it? Do you think it should be mainly on? Do you think it represents significant risk? What's your thoughts about the enabling it? Well, so if you have command line access to the server, right? If if you can if you can log into a Unix window and have a Unix command prompt, or or you you can log on the Windows and pull up a, 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 the Bash interpreter, or you can go into um, um, CMD, right? The the old DOS shell that's still under Windows, right? If you can get to that point, you have all the same access that the X command provides you. Because uh, because typically, and, and and unless they've horribly configured the uh, install incorrectly, um, the the SAS will run under your context, right? It runs as you, not as some super user. Mm -hmm. right. So so. If, if, so what you're saying, the question is not about if SAS shouldn't, should or shouldn't have a CMD command. It's more question, does this user should have a CMD access to the server? And then right. if by security model privileges, he already has access to it, then SAS should probably just reflect that. that that's my opinion, yeah. And, but yeah. again, this is, this is why I talk about you have a workaround. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a whole lot harder because now I have a shell script and I have two SAS programs uh, instead of putting everything into the SAS program and just using X command. Um, but yeah. I can do all the same stuff here. Makes sense. Uh, um, um, you know, some some admins are a little bit uh, paranoid. Uh, you know, I, I understand that, but... It's their job um, to be paranoid. It, it is, but... It, they, they also need to help us do our job within uh, in a safe manner, right? Uh, I don't think they should give us root access to everything. I'm not, not suggesting that. But if the security model protects the server and we already have that access, we should be able to. Makes sense. Um, has anyone got any other? I got plenty more questions to ask. Has anyone got any other questions? You could just unmute yourself and ask, or you could put it in the chat. I'm looking for any questions in chat now. Anyone else has to ask anything? Yeah, uh, uh, I agree with Quentin. You know, the the developers need to have, uh, fight for it. You know, ask, say, you know, what's the problem? You certainly can go in and do, um, um, you well, know, you, you you certainly can test the security, right? You you yeah. could get it turned on momentarily, or or you know, with with the uh, uh, at startup time for a special version with the admin and check permissions and mm -hmm. let the admin run it. Say, you know, can I do this thing that you're afraid of? Here's a program, try this All right. uh, in, in, a, in a cooperative manner rather than, a, um, you know, you're doing it wrong, you're messing me up. Mm. Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised the SAS on demand is using no X command. Um, I, I don't think SAS X, uh, sorry, SAS on demand allows shell access. No, I don't think it does. Yeah. Um, another question I, I had to ask, uh, was what do you think the, how do you think this is working in via four? Do you have any experience how this applies to via four? I have not tried via yet. Um, one of the things with, with VIA and, and GRID that you have to understand is that these are all working on multiple servers. So um, there, there may be some problem with the way um, file systems are set up if they're not shared across all servers. For instance, your home directory uh, is unique on each of the servers in the grid or in the cloud, right? Um, whereas if you, if you have a shared directory, typically where your data goes, uh, your permanent files go, uh, they are shared. Um, you know, an, an X command happening in one place uh, may not affect 
the whole environment. If, if I save a file to temp or, or to my home directory, uh, I may not be able to see it when I log in again because it's physically on a different box. Fair enough. Uh, Phil, you mentioned that um, administrator was persuaded to enable the command because of mission critical um, stuff, which is one way, of course, convincing it. But uh, I was wondering, David, if you have any reflection on how some customers could enable XCMD for certain set of users and disable it for other set of users, given that this is a system command that applied at application context level. Well, certainly uh, within within the uh, the config files, right, you can set options, and this is this is before uh, SAS the engine is at user context, uh, and and those are are essentially shell scripts, and you could set them up that uh, uh, depending on users or user permissions, um, uh, server name, uh, whatever, right. Um, that, that you could do that. All right. The way, the, so, way, the, the way that um, the, the SAS University edition did it, um, when, when you would ex fire off the command, it would actually, because uh, you were kicking off the command from uh, the web interface, when it would kick off the command on the command line internally, it had no X command. Hmm. Right. When, when, you know, right. So, so when you're using like the web interface, that's not the SAS engine, right? That's an editor. Yeah. And when you would say run it, you click the little, little, uh, the little running person. It then takes your file and ships it off to a SAS engine. Right. When it does that, it executed the Unix command that said, you know, run SAS, option, 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 no X command. Mm. Absolutely. So, Phil, extending on the topic, saying that you can configure multiple uh, workspace servers or multiple application context in that in that way, and uh, one can have access to XCMD command and the other one doesn't, which is a perfectly valid way of doing it. But David, you mentioned about using a shell script when the workspace server is being initialized, which means that you could put conditional logic in it, and then based on a user initializing the workspace server, some of them will have it enabled and others don't. Is that absolutely? Is that yeah, yeah, that's, okay. that's possible. Now, now that requires some innovation. That requires someone who uh, is is willing to um, work off of, off on something that isn't on a ticket. Yep. Right. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, at least uh, in large organizations in the U.S., we are seeing a lot of um, the admin types are working off of a ticketing system, and they're measured by meeting their SLA and how many tickets they close a month right. and setting up that kind of conditional logic uh, isn't going to be something they're going to do in five minutes unless they've done it before, right? The first time is the expensive time. Yeah. Uh, and, and while they're doing that, they're not closing 10 other tickets. Absolutely. Right. We've got a couple more minutes left. I have a couple of small announcements to make. Um, has anyone right. else got any other questions? Do I take it as a no? Um, so I've got two small announcements to make. Um, the first one is actually via four. Uh, David, you mentioned about that you haven't had a chance to play with it. You see how that behaves. Uh, the next webinar, the first uh, the first Thursday of uh, March, um, Analytu, as will be hosting a via four workshop with the access to anyone that registers for the webinar and joins. So if you haven't yet uh, popped back to the meetup, uh, register the credentials and some basic exercises will be shared during the Zoom call. I will set up. You will have a chance to log in into via four. Uh, interface and roam around as much as you like. It's a throwaway environment that we're going to bring up only for the meetup and we will destroy it after that. So you could do anything you like and have a go, have experience. Um, Analytium people, including myself, will be on the call to guide through a couple exercises, um, answer any questions and uh, resolve any technical challenges that, that you might have. So please do go ahead and register for the next meetup. The um, the other quick announcement I wanted to say is Analytium is entered into a partnership 
um, partnership research project with the University of Surrey. This is a project where we're working with them to assess the feasibility of creating a generalized data model for me small to medium-sized businesses. Now, most of you work for large enterprises or the government organizations that have a deep pockets. Unfortunately, the small to medium-sized businesses don't have a deep pockets, but just as equally, they can benefit from well-organized data from a, a set of frameworks or a framework to structure the data to get them that spring boost to the digital innovation for better reporting and so on. Uh, we are conducting several focus groups and we could really appreciate if you are working for a small to medium sized business uh, to get in touch with me or with Stefan here on the call and uh, put your hands up. You will benefit from the cutting edge research. You will benefit from interaction with the university. Uh, you will be able to contribute to the generalized data model and of course uh, benefit from it when it comes out. On that note, um, David, thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you here. Um, I hope that we will have a chance to listen to your other presentations in the future. And um, thank you very much again. Well, thank you very much for having me. And uh, you know, hopefully after all this COVID stuff is over, I'm, I may be in the, uh, the UK and uh, maybe it'll be uh, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the times for your actual meetings. Thank you. I, I hope so. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you, bye-bye.